My name is Alistair McKinley. I'm engineering manager at Analytics Engines. We're a, a big data um, consultancy and a product company in, in Belfast. Um, as part of some of the recent projects, engineering projects that I've been working on, um, we've been working on productization of existing R code uh, in a couple of different industries. So I'm going to talk about some of the things that we've, we've learned during that process, really, uh, in pharma and in, in, in fintech. Uh, I'll preface this also by saying I'm not really an R guy, so there's very little R actually in this talk. Uh, really, what I'm going to talk more about is how we've integrated uh, other people's R and built infrastructure around it to, in order to productize it. So, uh, like I said, uh, this is about productizing existing R code. Uh, and our experience uh, in these two industries, uh, in pharma and in, in fintech. So, um, yeah, we have other people, domain-specific experts, who have written some very uh, interesting R code in these industries, uh, and we have, to, we have to turn them into something reusable, either internally or something for the public uh, to consume. So, the problem with a lot of, uh, and well, in, in a lot of the things that I have seen in, in this area is that people, um, when they're building uh, a new algorithm or a new statistical uh, test or something in R, it can be a very iterative process. So sometimes, and we, uh, we just heard the previous speaker mention the fact that quite often these people aren't uh, developers. So sometimes uh, this, this iterative process can, can mean that the code ends up being slow, uh, brittle, uh, perhaps some of the scalability features required not, not in there. It can often be manually driven, people running scripts and changing parameters by hand. But that's where the value is, right? So we have to try and figure out a way to streamline that extraction of the, of the value into a product. Um, so how can we, how can we re reduce the, the pain of this process? How can we simplify? Uh, extracting the, the value from, from the domain-specific expertise um, and that intellectual property that's, that's written in R. So, uh, in my opinion, we want to minimize the amount of code changes that we, that we make in order to do that. We want to reuse as much as possible. And we can, we can help ourselves to do this by leveraging a lot of existing uh, open source technologies. And uh, that's really the focus of this discussion is some of those te other technologies that we've built around other people's R in order to to productize it. So th there are some concepts which come time and time again in this area and in, in, in my experience is that typically we have to we have to take some figure out what, what knobs we need to turn for the product, what things need to be configurable and what's what's fixed. So we need to, the, the users to be able to, to parameterize that execution of that code in a in a, an easy way. And key to that is automation of the uh, taking any manual steps, um, anything that's done by hand. Um, and building the automation into the, into the new product. Quite often we need to optimize. We might have things that are too slow for production usage and uh, that's certainly the case in these two, um, uh, these two areas. And if we put all those things together, they're probably is not quite a complete list here, but we, we can um, produce something uh, valuable and also consum easily consumable. So the first case study is in pharmaceuticals. So uh, this is a customer of ours who are doing DNA microarray analysis for biomarker detection. So they have a complex algorithm, which is their intellectual property, uh, and a complex, uh, ma largely manually driven pipeline um, before we started working with them. They had a lot of tools in that pipeline. They had Excel, which was a, man a manual process. We had Perl um, for a bit of data manipulation. We, of course, had the, the core intellectual property, which was implemented in, in R. And we also had some bits and pieces that were um, executed in MATLAB. So uh, there's quite a number of different tools in there. A lot of manual uh, labor required to execute this. Um, and some other additional functionality that they wanted wasn't really addable to this pipeline. So that's where, that's where we, we uh, came in with our solution. So the first requirement is automation, because what, what they're looking to use this IP for is to enable data-driven discovery. So they want to massively increase the scale of the execution of their IP. Uh, and that requires automation and removing all of the manual, um, manual processes to enable that. 
So they, they need massive compute scalability in order to do this in reasonable time frames. So we chose um, to implement this in a cloud platform so that we could utilize the elastic compute capabilities of the cloud. Um, because of that, then we have to use tools that are suitable for cloud usage. So that means replacing uh, some of the old pipeline. That means removing Excel. That means removing MATLAB. So um, that's the first piece that enables our automation is using things that can be suitably uh, licensed and are usable inside uh, a very large, uh, scalable cloud environment. So, uh, as I said, I'm not really talking too much about R. Um, I'm actually more uh, C and Python guy, and um, uh, so I'm with the rest of my colleagues. Um, but we built the pipeline, rebuilt the pipeline, and wrapped the existing IP using, using Python. So we took our, the Excel and Perl, which was used mostly for um, data processing, uh, and re-implemented uh, that in Python plus Pandas. The MATLAB code, um, we actually couldn't really find a good replacement in R for this, so we ended up using some C libraries with some Python wrappers. Um, and our simplified pipeline now looks like this. So we have our data processing piece, which is done in Python and Pandas. We have our core intellectual property, which we're using RPy2 in order to, to wrap that, that R code. Um, which is based on the Bioconductor and some of the additional, additional C libraries. So uh, another key concept to enabling this, uh, these feature, new features required for the customer was scalability. Uh, so we now we have users who want to be able to consume this product internally. And we have our redefined um, simplified pipeline, which has been re-implemented in Python. And now we need to add some uh, additional features in order to give us the scale. Well, on the usability side, we have uh, front end written in Python Flask. So this is really where our, our users are, are doing our parameterization of that R code. So they're doing it through a web interface. Um, and then, of course, we have Hadoop. Because we have large amounts of input data and large amounts of uh, output analysis data. So in order to allow, to allow us to scale the storage, we have Hadoop on either end of the pipeline. Uh, for compute, um, scalability, we're using Celery, Python Celery, and EC Amazon uh, AWS EC2. So um, we can utilize the, the elastic capabilities of EC2 auto-scaling to give us you know, huge on-demand on uh, compute capability when required. So the con to conclude this first case study, um, we retained as much R code as possible. So of course, all of the core IP is virtually untouched apart from some minor refactoring for you know, selecting the, the, uh, the parameters that are required in production. Uh, we retained the R for the visualization code that they had written, literally just dumping, uh, dumping pictures into, into Hadoop directories for particular analysis runs, also making those available through the web interface. The additional tools that we built up around this using Python, using Flask, Hadoop, Celery, and AWS, they give us the scale the capability to automate this, and additionally, the ease of use for in, uh, internal consumers of the product. So the second case study is in financial technology. Um, it starts with a similar sort of story. We have a domain expert um, who has written an his own algorithm in R for predictive analytics in the bond market. Um, and he dis uh, discovered that Compared to the major competitors in this area, uh, his algorithm was significantly more, more accurate than the major players. So he's, he's a startup and he's, he's getting a lot, of, a lot of interest in this particular algorithm. Um, but it was an exploratory R script, really. Um, it was brittle and it was slow and it wasn't usable for a product. Um, um, this, is, this is what we did in order to, to, uh, to, build, it, to build a product out of that. So the requirements were firstly optimization in this case because uh, uh, it really wasn't fast enough for, for daily usage. This has to be uh, predictions made based on new financial data coming in from a financial data provider every day. Um, and additionally, we have to automate the ETL process, which was in his test code basically uh, CSVs that he'd uh, gathered. Um, and manually uh, transformed into the particular format that he needed. So we, we, we had to pull this in, do this, re, uh, replicate this ETL step uh, in a way that could be automated on a daily basis. And this enables us then to productize uh, the algorithm uh, for use inside a, a daily changing market uh, and allowing users to, to consume the output of this, this algorithm. 
So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the optimization step here. Um, this is actually uh, one of my uh, interests. I have a background in, in high performance computing. Um, so I went looking for this bottleneck. Um, what we discovered was that it wasn't exactly where we thought it was. And it wasn't where the customer thought it was. Um, he believed that it was at the core of his uh, predictive analytics algorithm, was, and that certainly would have been the obvious place to look for this particular bottleneck. What I found was uh, that wasn't the case. So this is the output of uh, an Intel uh, performance tool called uh, Intel VTune. So you can actually use this with the R interpreter to get some really fine-grained detailed information about where bottlenecks are inside uh, an R program. So uh, from this view, we can see that uh, there's something happening inside uh, libr itself, which is consuming all the CPU time. Um, so when we look a little bit deeper into on a function level, we can see that the, there's this function called run gem collect, which is consuming all the CPU time. Um, actually, this is part of the R internal garbage collection routines. So when we looked uh, a bit looked for this bottleneck where it was happening inside the R, we found that it was actually one line of R code that was called repeatedly. So uh, what's happening here is um, this particular algorithm uh, does a huge amount of sampling uh, of the data when it's building, building its predictive model, um, much more than you would expect. Um, and the implementation of this selection, so basically each time this was uh, executing, we pick a, a random row from the input data set based on a group by key uh, on one of the, one of the columns. Um, and what we found was that this random rows function that was implemented originally by um, the, the, our customer uh, was creating an enormous amount of temporary objects. And so we were getting huge amounts of garbage collection, which turned out to be the major bottleneck. Um, so being uh, an HPC lover myself, I decided to solve this with RCPP. Um, Truth be told, this probably could have been fixed by just restructuring the R code, but I wanted to test out the capabilities of RCPP, and I was very uh, pleased um, with uh, the capabilities of being able to write some inline modern C++11 um, code inside my R script, uh, using you know, metaprogramming uh, for, for different data types, um, integration also with the um, our random number generators, which was, was uh, is a key point, because um, if you're if you're writing an RCPP function, which needs some randomness, you have to be very careful with uh, using the random number generator. Uh, if you use any C standard library RNGs, for example, you will uh, get uh, not reproducible. Excuse me. Uh, results that are not reproducible. So we want to be able to produce with our RCPP function the exact same results that would have been produced by our R script. So you need to be careful when using that to use the an RNG scope and to call the R random number generators from within your RCPP module. Thankfully, uh, RCPP is uh, a lot of features to make that very, very easy. Uh, so uh, really, I was really pleased with that. Um, so when we actually did the, the benchmarking of this module, um, what we found was a, a huge speed up, actually. Um, so we were able to, uh, th this particular uh, implementation was about 600 times faster, um, which resulted in a, you know, a speed up of the, in the, total, uh, the program as a whole of about 10 or, or 11. Um, so th that was really key in enabling this uh, particular algorithm to run on, d on a daily basis. Uh, like I said, this probably could have been fixed by restructuring the R, but I thought that was interesting to, to use RCPP. Um, so the, the other major requirement here is automation, because this needs to be updated every day and needs to be consumed by, by paying customers. So we have to build a, a daily pipeline uh, that re-scores uh, the data uh, using the models and updated financial information from the provider, as well as the uh, user interface for those users to actually consume it through a web UI. So we have uh, a slightly um, altered pipeline. We have some uh, an FTP provider actually for the financial data. And we've moved our ETL into Postgres. 
So um, the, uh, the ETL that was originally done um, by hand um, with Excel, we've now moved that into SQL inside Postgres. And we're using that as the source for our, our, our slightly refactored uh, um, algorithm, plus our optimizations to enable it to run uh, on a daily basis. And then we have the, the, the scores, the, the predictions, actually I put just back into Postgres. This is wrapped in Python. All of the R code is wrapped in RPy2 from within our, our Python pipeline. And uh, based, using um, a Linux server, we have this wrapped in a system, system D uh, service, which allows us to um, flexibly interact with this pipeline that, uh, and schedule it uh, for execution uh, on a daily basis. Um, and of course, we have a user interface we, we, from our database, which is our, the real valuable data that the customers need to consume. We have uh, Flask and, and Python, and then we have hopefully happy users um, who get great predictions. So that's, that's the idea anyway. So um, that's actually, this is my last slide. Um, hopefully, um, I've been clear enough about um, how we've used leverage of existing open source technologies um, to allow us to productize our code. Um, what, one of the key aspects is we want, we want to maximally reuse our existing code. We don't want to have to go and reinvent the wheel if we want to make a product out of some, some R code. So um, using those, those additional technologies and building the infrastructure around the, the algorithms themselves, we can, we, we can achieve this by, with minimal code changes. Um, if you have something which is not slow enough for, or not fast enough for production usage, make sure that you, you profile thoroughly uh, and really only uh, optimize whenever, whenever it's uh, necessary in the, in the key. Find, finding those key bottlenecks is the, is the first step. Uh, you must make sure that uh, you don't uh, prematurely optimize. Um, it can be a, a big waste of time. Uh, and you can use um, successfully use uh, Intel sampling profilers to do that as well, uh, which is, which is the, the technique that, that I used. Um, you can build your products from your R code using license-free tools. And um, the other thing, the other conclusion is that if you want to um, integrate some existing R, Python is a really, really good way to do that. Um, and these are some of the tools that we've used in both of these uh, use cases. Obviously Python, Flask, HDFS, uh, Python Celery, uh, AWS itself, uh, uh, and Postgres. Um, so that's me finished. Um, hopefully that there's something uh, you were able to pick up there. So if you have any questions, please go ahead. <laughs>